hopefully that has given everyone enough time to get into the uh, webinar. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this LAPAM's quarterly virtual event, a conversation based around our latest issue, Freedom, featuring Astra Taylor, Nadia Durbach, and Graham Burnett, moderated by Zoe Beery. My name is Soraya Field Fiorio, and I'm the Education Program Director here at LAPAM's Quarterly. We're pleased to host this event in collaboration with our sponsors, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, who underwrites our public programs, and the Alumbra Innovations Foundation, whose generosity enables us to support K-12 and community college educators across the country. The Freedom Issue of Lapham's Quarterly features 100 voices, ancient arguments about free will, political rights, and the treatment of manumitted slaves to contemporary debates over power, access, and opportunity. In a conversation building on the issue, Taylor, Durbach, and Burnett will discuss their work in current movements and arenas in which freedom is contested and redefined. If you're not already a subscriber to the magazine, please consider becoming one today. I'll paste the link in the chat and you'll receive freedom as the first issue in your year long subscription. Today's conversation will run about an hour, including time at the end for audience Q&A. To submit a question to the panelists, please use the Q&A function it's the icon at the bottom of your screen with two speech bubbles. Only questions from the Q&A will be answered. Without further ado, please let me introduce our speakers. Astra Taylor is the author most recently of Remake the World, Essays, Reflections, Rebellions. She directed the documentaries, What is Democracy, Examine Life, and Zizek. A co-founder of the Debt Collective, Taylor has written for the New York Times, the London Review of Books, and The Guardian, as well as many other outlets. Nadia Durbach was born in the United Kingdom. She grew up in Canada and attended the University of British Columbia. In 2000, she completed her PhD at Johns Hopkins University and joined the faculty of the University of Utah's History Department, where she is currently a professor. She is the author most recently of Many Mouths, the political food in Britain from the workhouse to the welfare state. Born in France and based in New York City, Graham Burnett trained in history and philosophy of science at Cambridge University and teaches at Princeton. He works at the intersection of historical inquiry and artistic practice, and his writing and collaborations focus on experimental and experiential approaches to textual material, pedagogical modes, and hermeneutic activities traditionally associated with the research humanities. Recent projects include The Third Meaning at the Fry Art Museum in Seattle. He is a member of the Lapham's Quarterly Editorial Board. And finally, Zoe Beery, our moderator, is during the day a freelance writer based in Brooklyn whose work on social and economic justice has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Baffler, and many other publications. At night, she organizes harm reduction and safer space programs for electronic music parties, clubs, and festivals in the US and Europe. Um, panelists, I will now ask you to come back on screen and unmute yourself, and I'm going to hand over the session to Zoe. Thank you so much for that intro, Soraya. Um, thank you everyone for being here. And thank you so much to the panelists for participating in this conversation. Uh, I wanna start with the basics um, that are gonna undergird this conversation, hearing from each of you um, about as applicable your essays in this issue of Lapham's um, and the topic of freedom more generally. So let's start with you, Nadia. You contributed an essay to this issue. Could you talk about uh, what it's about? Sure. First, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today, but also for inviting me to contribute to LAPAMS. It was a really fantastic experience for me because it was about sharing what has always been kind of academic historical work with a larger audience. And my essay in LAPAMS is about what I like to call the original anti-vaccination movement. So we've all been sort of reintroduced to anti-vaccinationism in the age of COVID um, as many different states or organizations introduced vaccine mandates, many people resisted that. But this resistance dates very far back. And so my essay is about what happened in Britain um, in the wake of an 1853 
government mandate that required all children to be vaccinated against smallpox. And sort of in the wake of the government um, requiring this of its citizens, a very active anti-vaccination movement formed, and it formed really on the basis of the idea of medical liberty, the idea that one's body, one's person is one's own to do with as one pleases, as well as the bodies of one's children. And so we saw a really um, vocal and active resistance movement against what was considered sort of big government and the government interfering with people's rights over their bodies. And so my essay really explores this concept of of medical liberty, the rights over the person, and the idea that some people see themselves or feel themselves to be second-class citizens when they lose the ability to make their own decisions about their bodies. Wonderful, thank you for that. And Astro, let's continue with you. Yes, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. I guess I come from the opposite perspective as a non-academic, um, sort of feral intellectual activist getting invited into Lapham's Quarterly. Um, I, I wrote a piece about a, a historical figure, a hero of mine, Benjamin Lay, really based on the wonderful book by Marcus, the historian Marcus Redeker, The Fearless Benjamin Lay. Um, and uh, Sarah Fan, who was uh, until recently an editor at Lapham's, knew that, knew that Lay is one of my personal icons. And so, uh, invited me to write about him in the context of this issue because I think he's a wonderful exemplar of freedom. Um, you know, he was born in the late 1600s in Essex, England, a family of modest mean, means and became one of the most formidable fighters for an, ex an incredibly expansive contemporary notion of freedom of what we now call sort of intersectional freedom. So really was a pivotal figure pushing the Quaker community, which he was, he was born into, uh, to become, you know, boldly uh, against, to stand boldly against slavery, not just in words, but in deeds. <laughs> and, um, but connected that struggle to, um, you know, a very uh, profound sense of um, freedom for, you know, of, of gender equity, um, of also freedom for the, for non-human animals. Um, and as an organizer, uh, you know, the, what the piece does was, is just recount some of his you know, antics, uh, he essentially sort of invented guerrilla theater and really pushed um, pushed his religious community to enact their values, right? And that meant that he was willing to make people very uncomfortable and to live in discomfort. I mean, the part of him too is he essentially uh, lived an ascetic life. Uh, at the end of his life, he you know sort of even lived in a cave with his books, <laughs> but not in a sense of sort of asceticism as a retreat, but just as like living with his living with his uh, living in line with his morals and still pushing the broader community. Uh, and then tying that, I think the real you know why this essay was worth writing and publishing is that there's real lessons for today. Um, you know, before there was a Bill of Rights, Benjamin Lay's speech was remarkably free. <laughs> And you know he again had a sense of freedom with, um, you know, the, none of us are free until all of us are free. Uh, and he challenges the pat insistence from so many that we can't judge people of the past, right, by our standards. Um, this was a guy who, despite having you sort of no formal education or authority, inspired you know he, the first biographer who wrote about him was Benjamin Rush. His portrait was painted, commissioned by um, Benjamin Franklin's wife for Benjamin Franklin. So he was getting his ideas out there, challenging people, circulating thoughts that are still wonderfully dangerous today. Wonderful, thank you. And Graham, you don't have an essay in this uh, issue, but um, more broadly, what, what brings you to this conversation about freedom and especially as it pertains to what Astra and Nadia have contributed? Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful pleasure to be on the panel and to uh, talk with two such distinguished um, guests. Um, so I've been involved with uh, Lapham's for a long time, and I think in some ways uh, I probably slightly s split the difference of the other two primary panelists. Um, I did I have a PhD in the history and philosophy of science, and um, have a strong interest in understanding the way. Uh, technology and sort of conceptual command of nature have informed how human beings conceive themselves. I got interested in history of science because of the interest of, of that central question. Um, 
And the history of science has been one of the amazing places where people have come to think of themselves as potentially in certain ways not free at a very deep level. So if one thinks of the dialectic of freedom and determinism, the explanatory power of the sciences have increasingly persuaded people that almost everything is determinate that is caused by other things, leaving smaller and smaller room in which a sort of metaphysical or transcendent notion of individual freedom could be defended on the basis of our understanding of matter in motion. Uh, so I have an interest in these questions uh, in that way. But I also have a kind of an activist life. Um, and for most of the last 10 years, the topic in the history of science and technology that has most interested me is the history of the study of attention, human attention, our ability to pay attention, uh, the scientific study of that in laboratories. Um, and importantly, the commodification of our attention in the emergence of the attention economy uh, across the late 20th century. So I study how scientists slice and dice attention in laboratories so it can be priced in the marketplace. And right now, I would say that the a major freedom we need to continue to pursue and protect um, around which there needs to be consciousness raising and uh, awareness and activism is the freedom of attention from the fracking power of um, our kind of platform capital ecology. So that's a place I'll hope to speak as the conversation unfolds. Yes, I'm definitely looking forward to speaking with you about that a little bit later. And you brought something up that is related to a question that I wanted to ask you, Nadia. Um, Graham, you just mentioned how people conceive of themselves as being a major component of um, history of science, history of medicine. And, you know, Nadia, you talk about uh, this sort of first wave of the anti-vax movement, and we do have this very direct parallel with anti-vaxxers today. But a thing that I was really struck by reading your essay is that there's a very big difference in um, class in who engages in anti-vaccine activism um, in the 19th century versus today. Uh, your essay talks about how the people who were most engaged in this movement were poor people who uh, risked a lot of disease in how vaccines were applied and where they were given um, and how they were punished financially for not vaccinating their children. Whereas now, at least for me, certainly, I associate the anti-vax movement, not just vaccine hesitancy in general, with more middle class, wealthy people who see vaccines as like an impingement on their freedom and they want the freedom to choose not to be vaccinated, even though we now have, you know, everybody gets the same vaccine in roughly the same, same context. And so I'm curious um, from your perspective about how that shift happened and what we can learn about concepts of bodily autonomy from comparing those two movements. That's a great question. And I think one of the things I was most struck with and what drew me to the study of the anti-vaccination movement in the 19th century was the class component. When I was looking for um, a topic for my dissertation, I was looking deliberately to work on something that told us something about class and the body, the relationship between class and the body. I think in the United States, class is not something we talk about very much, but in the United Kingdom, it's a very central kind of way in which hierarchies are established and always have been. And so in the 19th century, so the original anti-vaccinators were um, sort of a coalition group. And some of those people were middle class. They were elites who were involved in the movement because of kind of philosophical issues around government. They believed in a smaller government, um, less state intervention in the economy, but also just in private life in general. But the, the kind of major component of people who were sort of grassroots anti-vaccinators were members of people who would have identified themselves as either poor or working class. And one of their kind of major arguments was that they, as a group, um, because they were shut out of the franchise, so they were, until the 1880s, um, working class men even didn't have the vote, never mind women who didn't have the vote until the 20th century, um, they felt themselves to be second class citizens. And so they felt that their children were being preyed on, were being experimental material, were being used to test this kind of relatively new medical technology. And they felt that um, in doing this, the state had sort of um, 
lead their children into second class citizens. And so their resistance, their kind of call for freedom, for um, what they called our medical liberties, was really based on the idea that in this hierarchically organized society, the working class had fewer rights. And that was being very explicitly played out on the site, not only of the body, everyone's bodies, but particularly the most vulnerable bodies in society, the newly born. And so um, their infants, their babies, who were the ones subjected to these compulsory vaccination laws, became um, these very sort of fraught bodies who were sort of epitomized as the most vulnerable and thus the least free right, because they were um, compelled to do this by the state. So both the parents were unfree, but also these children. And so class was an incredibly important component of the 19th century anti-vaccination movement, precisely because the working class felt that they were being targeted as the spreaders of disease, that they were being required to vaccinate, could not buy themselves out, could not use sort of loopholes in the law, could not use um, private doctors because they couldn't afford that, um, that they were then becoming um, these kind of like very explicitly unfree bodies because of their class status. And I think um, what happened really over the course of the late 20th century, I think anti-vaccination movement really went into decline once it became possible to get exemption. So um, by the early 20th century, one could get what was called a conscientious objection to the vaccination laws and sort of exempt oneself out by going before a magistrate. But in the 20th century, when the anti-vaccination movement sort of reappeared, it reappeared really, I think, in the context, particularly in the 1990s, of sort of organic food movements, um, naturopathy, a lot of which catered to middle and upper middle class families who had the money to buy those kinds of foods. Um, and we see it sort of reemerging initially before COVID in relationship to those kind of more elite mothering groups. Um, and when I was doing my dissertation, I kind of attended some of these sort of anti-vaccination movements to see who was there and it was people who could afford to you know, participate in that kind of um, parenting strategy that involved naturopathic foods or organic, the organic movements. Yeah, it's, it's interesting hearing you talk. I, I grew up in a town that was very suffused with this kind of thinking and there is a, a tenor to it of, oh, I want freedom from the things that are being imposed on me in my food, in education, um, and it gets phrased uh, around um, an individual kind of freedom that is sometimes at the direct cost of, uh, of community, the community freedom that comes with vaccination. Um, and one thing that, that I wanna kind of transition into a question that I had for Astra that does have also a connection to your writing was that in the time um, that you were writing about and also in the time that Astra was writing about, there was a little bit more of a direct connection for asking for address of your grievances around your own freedom and your own autonomy. You know, um, in the case of Thomas Lay, uh, he was standing outside smashing this pottery, which I hope you can get into a little bit, Astra, um, about, uh, about that performative component of his protest. Um, and the people who he was trying to address were walking by him. They were in his community. And similarly, the people in this original anti-vax movement that you covered, Nadia, they had a little bit more of a direct connection to the people who had the power to, um, as they saw it, take away their freedom. Um, and after the question that I, I wanted to ask you is that as I was reading your essay, I was thinking about how since that time there has grown this whole I don't know, maybe category of things that suppress our freedoms that are very intangible and diffuse, um, algorithms, super PACs, things like that, that we don't have direct access to. Maybe, maybe we go to a shareholder meeting or something like that. Um, whereas uh, in what you're writing about, the, the wonderful sort of militant performance style was noticeable by the people who could redress or address this lack of freedom. And so I'm curious to hear from you how you see the lineage of Lay's protest uh, continuing now into protest movements where we may not be able to so directly interject into the daily lives of the people who were denying freedoms in the way that we would like to see change. Oh man, that's such a loaded question for me today. <laughs> okay. Right this minute as the Senate is having a vote to undo 10 years of activism that I've been involved in. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, one thing I appreciate, I guess, about Nadia's essay too, is as you're painting this portrait of anti-vaxxers, and I think, you know, it's important to be, you know, uh, in some cases, contemptuous of the anti-vax movement today, but that their grievances weren't totally off the wall, right? I mean, poor people, as you said, didn't have the right to um, buy out or go to a private doctor. They were being subjected to, to uh, you know, treatment that they felt was, you know, dehum dehumanizing and stuff like that. So there's, there's, I think, it, I guess I just want to say, as an organizer, you have to speak to people's distrust and grievances and then try to direct them away from those. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, context for me is that I've been organizing for the last 10 years, building the country's first debtors union. So uh, just like there are labor unions for people to exert power on the job, we, um, you know, debt is a form of economic power, and we see it as a potential form of leverage. So we organize people to fight unjust medical bills in the hopes of having universal health care. We're most known for our work on student debt cancellation. Believe, you know, we believe education is a public good, that everyone should have access to it. Um, we, we work with people who have carceral debts, back rent debt they can't pay, and so on. Um, and this is precisely, it's one of those invisible forces, right? You know, it's something that impacts your life and people feel a lot of anxiety over the bills they have to pay at the end of the month, but where do you go <laughs> to exert power as a citizen over this, to change these things? I mean, under the conditions, you know, under our current economic conditions, you know, also, you know, sort of the private sector and the state are so interwoven, right? So your student debt, most of it is held by the Department of Education, but then it's private loan servicers collecting on it. And you know, so this is the neoliberal hybrid. Um, but where are those, where, where, where do you go to exert power, uh, exert pressure? And you know, many of Lay, Benjamin Lay's tactics are still, you know, we're still using them today. I think that's part of why I was so struck by him. It's like, well, we're still doing guerrilla theater. Um, you know, we do these theatrical, but very, you know, they're not just purely symbolic, but these things called debtors assemblies where people sort of step forward and tell the stories that they're holding silently, which, you know, so thus they're invisible, they're unspoken, um, and share, you know, share their debts in public. So suddenly you make the number visible. Well, I owe $200,000 in student loans, you know, I owe $50,000 in medical debt. And, you know, so a first step is making, making the invisible visible. Well, who do you owe it to? Let's find those connections and, um, and try to, to build, build power together. Um, but yeah, there's something, I mean, Benjamin Lay, he was, you, you mentioned him smashing the China in 1742. He sets up a table downtown in Philadelphia, which, you know, was the center of power <laughs> at that moment. And he starts smashing this, this China that had uh, belonged to his, his wife who had died. Um, and, you know, you have to imagine this, and another thing about Benjamin Lay is he was a little person. He didn't, he stood less than five feet tall. He was a hunchback. I mean, he was someone who, um, again, embodied, uh, uh, you know, he knew discrimination firsthand given his embodiment. Um, and he turned that into this amazing solidarity with everyone else who was stigmatized and, and dispossessed. And, um, you know, and he's smashing this and de denouncing tyrants, denouncing slaveholders, denouncing tyrants in India who are uh, exploiting workers to, you know, because it's China, it's teacups and saying, look, you know, it's, and what happens is the crowd rushes to him to save the China <laughs> and they you know, manhandle him. They literally pick him up off the ground and throw him away. And you know, what they do is they get sucked into his performance and they literally show with their actions, like we care more about these objects than about the message that you're sending. The fact that enslaved people are producing the sugar um, and that exploited workers are producing the tea. Um, he would you know, go and, and discomfort his community, his fellow Quakers who kept, you know, kicking him out uh, by literally lying in the doorway. So they had to step over his body, right? Um, and, uh, you know, and we still need to do that. We still need to make people uncomfortable. <laughs> we still need to be able to push the envelope um, and, uh, you know, to try to match match actions with deeds. So in some ways we're still using Lay's tactics, you know, and, and not in some ways, in many ways. I mean, that's the sort of standard components of the organizing tool, toolkit. To bring it back to Graham's comments though, this is, I think sometimes we think attention is all we need and we are in an attention economy. I wrote a book that came out in 2014 called The People's Platform that was about the political economy of the internet. And, you know, our attention is absolutely, it is the commodity online. It's being uh, directed um, in ways that, you know, we as just sort of the users of the internet can't control. Um, 
And, uh, but attention on its own is never enough. You know, it, attention is in power. Um, and I think that is, you know, so, so Benjamin Lee was very strategic in who he was calling attention to. He was pressuring the people who had power in the Quaker community, right? He was targeting the elders, targeting the people who had the ability to set the moral framework for the community. And he was calling out their conflicts of interest, right? Well, oh, you support slavery? Well, hey, you happen to be making money off of this, right? <laughs> Drawing those lines. So he was strategic in who his audience was. Uh, he didn't just think attention, I think, was good for its own sake. He didn't just want to call attention to himself because he was you know, into it. He lived in a cave. He was happy reading his books. And But, you know, so I think tension is, you know, we could go on and on about this, but attention is an interesting thing for organizers, right? Because we need it, but it's not enough. And there's almost like we joke that there's an attention, uh, uh, unawareness industrial complex, right? Mm -hmm. People are like, tell your stories, use your voice. We need to build actual material economic power if we want to change things. And so Benjamin Lay, uh, you know, there's much I admire about him, but he did have a real attention to economics and, and, the evils of money, right? And he knew money is what dri is driving the system and driving people to exploit other human beings. Yeah, and I wanna move on to attention in just one moment, but I, I had one quick follow-up for you, Astra. You were mentioning um, when you have these debtors meetings, people voicing, this is how much debt I have, and then looking up who is holding this debt. I mean, would you, in your observation of seeing people actually name their debt and the people to who they theoretically owe it, do you see a sense of freedom that people experience in just stating what's going on for them? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is that debt, you know, precedes capitalism as a tool of economic and political control, right? That's why we have debtors revolts in the in the ancient world all the time. Literally, debt's connection to slavery, right? So you have people often going into debt in ancient Rome, for example, and being forced into debt bondage, um, and you know, so uh, absolutely, there is a kind of freedom in truth and in we you know it's a casting away of shame right and realizing that actually uh and a challenging of the myth that everything's personal responsibility your debt is your fault you're poor because you're bad <laughs> right so you're saying well hold on there's a systemic issue here um i don't know i guess i see freedom as a kind of horizon so you've got a modicum more freedom once you start challenging those myths that are designed to control you um but ultimately you know, freedom for me is a collective phenomenon. And so what, what the sharing is really about is trying to build those bonds of solidarity so you can, or, you know, organize uh, to transform the, the structures. But today, when I was saying today is about, you know, literally at this moment, uh, I probably just wrapped up, the Senate is voting to pass this, this uh, law that would roll back Biden's debt cancellation plan, right? So in other words, we've fought for debt or freedom for 10 years and now, or, there's a, a backlash against that, that is holding on. Why do they care about this? Literally, they say explicitly, we don't want student debt relief for people because they won't work shitty jobs. Like that is some, that's the logic behind one of the, the Supreme Court cases, you know? So um, yeah, so they're, you know, they want to keep people unfree. <laughs> uh, I absolutely hear that. And um, moving on to, to this talk about attention that you brought up, Astra, and that's so much of a focus of your work, Graham. Um, I was reading about the Friends of Attention, which is a group that you collaborate with um, in your work, and they have the, these 12 theses of attention um, that, I'm, that I was reading, and the first one I'm gonna read it is, the astonishing reality of things and persons. This is the object of pure attention. And what struck me about this one, especially being the, the first of the theses, the one upon which perhaps all the rest are built, or at least the first one that's mentioned, is that in both the case of, of Nadia and Astra, their essays are about people who gave, who, who perceived astonishing conditions as actually astonishing mm -hmm. and kind of demanded that other people notice and validate that they were astonishing. Um, not just getting their attention, but then using that attention to say, why are you not seeing the reality around me? Why are you not paying the attention that I that I am paying? And I wanted to hear more from you just about why you see attention as core to the pursuit and manifestation of freedom, and, and maybe even as a skill that we develop in that pursuit. Oh, it's a uh, it's a great question. Um, I almost want to pull back, you know, just a half step and and note the interesting um, composition of the panel, you know, we have uh, in Nadja, like a historian who's given us a very concrete situation in which freedom was at stake for people. People stepped forward and left testimony that they felt that their bodily integrity 
and their ability to um, control the lives uh, of their intimates, family, children, you know, that all that was at stake in the interventions of the state. And it's really, it's a powerful historical and specific moment in which people said, wait, I'm a free subject of the crown and it is inappropriate for me to be subjected to this kind of interference that comes so near to me. I should be free of this. Um, and then, you know, we have a real activist, you know, my admiration is boundless for Astro's work, who sang like concrete situations now in which people are being subjected to interference and their ability to operate freely in the world is being compromised. And we need to do something about that. Um, in some ways, you know, the 12 theses are an exercise in theory poetry. And the composition of this panel makes me want to sort of put on my philosopher hat a little bit and take a, a moment with the question of um, the philosophy of freedom. Um, we have a concrete historical situation. We have concrete present situations where activism is needed. Um, but that question of whether something like agential, autonomous, responsibility bearing, freedom is even possible to conceive, like whether it's real about us, that's like one of the oldest and hardest philosophical questions, you know, free will as against determinism. To what extent are we playing out scripts that are either written by the gods or are um, installed in the unfolding of matter? Um, and uh, part of the reason that I'm so fascinated with attention is that I actually think um, that while it's true that our attention economy and the fracking of our eyeballs for money value for advertisers presents a new and genuinely imperiling condition for our capacity to care for ourselves and our relations with others and our communities and the earth. I also believe that the language of attention provides a very powerful language for invoking the deepest kind of agential autonomy, meaning freedom. Um, and a little loop here, um, you know, William James, very important late 19th, early 20th century philosopher and psychologist, the guy who's responsible for that, you know, image of the stream of consciousness and wrote a great and important book called The Principles of Psychology uh, at the dawn of the 20th century, has a very important chapter on attention in that book. And in that book, what he says is, look, all my scientist colleagues at this point basically believe that there's no such thing as free will, that we're there's matter in motion and we're part of that little complex eddies of matter in motion and that everything that we do is the result of cause and effect, just like billiard balls, basically. And he further says, I myself have a lot of trouble understanding any way I could make a philosophical argument based on what I know about the way physics works that would kind of falsify that assertion. And that, he thinks, leads to kind of pessimism, doom, a, a sense of the human as um, a kind of um, tragic slave to conditions, regardless of how emancipated we think we are. And then in a crucial moment in that chapter 11, he literally says, I believe voluntary attention, which I can't prove to you is free. I can't prove to you that you can put your mind or your senses here versus there. I can't prove to you that that isn't being caused by some deeper chain of cause and effect. But if there's such a thing as human freedom, our best bet for being able to locate its origin is in our ability to direct our attention, cognitive and sensory, here versus there. It's like the clinamen, the swerve, you know, in Lucretius. All the particles under the original condition are all falling kind of equidistant from each other at the same rate. And somehow some little swerve sets in play all the cascading kind of consequences that produce the world as we know it. And for James, that moment of choosing 
to place our attention here versus there is that swerve uh, upon which the very idea of human freedom is founded, if it can be founded uh, anywhere. So I do think that that like gives some sense of the metaphysical urgency of attention in relation to the conversation about um, f freedom. And, and just to say quickly, if I can, on astonishment, because it's such a beautiful um, idea that that each of these stories is a story of like astonishment. Um, you know, the very idea of a critical theory is that there could be truths about the world that simply coming to see would produce emancipation, that we would be emancipated by seeing the truth. Uh, and that's the kind of conceptual structure of, of Marx's theory of capital. It's like once you understand what you're like what a commodity is, you're freed from enslavement to the commodity. It's what Freud's psychoanalytic theory is. It's like once you understand the way your um, subconscious is informing your actions, you can be meaningfully emancipated from enslavement to that. So this idea that like an astonishing encounter with the truth can itself produce freedom, this is like the, the most beautiful thought about thinking that we've had pretty much. Um, I wanted to, to go back um, as we were having our little pre-meeting before we started the webinar. Um, Astra and Nadia, you were talking and you began talking about the parallels that you see between um, the essays that you've both written. And I, I wanted to, to start with you, Astra, if you could elaborate a little bit on on um, what excited you about reading Nadia's essay from your perspective. And then I would like to hear the same from you, Nadia. Yeah, so much. I do wanna say just to Graham's point though, that the astonishment, this idea that we can, Benjamin Lay used this language a lot, wake up, right? Activists use this all, let's wake up. But that's also why there's a war on woke. <laughs> that's why that is one of the most potent reactionary formations is, you know, actually if you, you know, um, it's a strategy of divide and conquer, right? Like don't, don't be astonished, don't pay attention. Uh, you know, be have lean into your resentments and your grievances and stuff like that. Um, so, and then, and then just based on that, you know, the thing is who who is in a position to see? And I think one thing that's so interesting about the history of freedom is philosophers have written wonderful things about freedom over the years. It, it is a concept that we associate uh, with with theory and with a kind of um, uh, universal perspective, but it's also something that the, the vision of freedom we have really has come from situated fights. Orlando Patterson talks about that in his you know, great treatise on freedom, who, who first came up with this concept, enslaved, the first people who were enslaved, who he says were enslaved women generally, you know, that it's the experience of suffering, of dispossession, of, of being controlled, of being exploited that gives people this insight, you know, this longing for freedom that has been so powerful and so poetic. Um, and, and so I think naming that, right, like who are the real experts in freedom, it's the people who are the least free probably, <laughs> and who have really put this idea on the agenda and moved it forward. Um, I mean, I just thought it was fascinating. I mean, you know, it's, as the, the historical resonance, right? I mean, I see Lay fighting these fights, using these tactics, <laughs> calling out hypocrisy, uh, making connections. I mean, one thing I love about Lay is that he's again, making connections with, the, the not, uh, with animals, you know, and um, so ahead of his time to be this disabled vegan radical. Um, and uh, and so to see, um, yeah, to see those resonance in, in, in your piece was really fascinating. Um, and just in, I think in the, the class confusion, right? I mean, I thought the class dynamics of your piece were complicated and, um, and they're complicated today too, right? You know, how do we make alliances with people um, when there are these class barriers and this question of distrust, right? Like, you know, the people that you portray in this first vaccination moment, again, they had a reason to be distrustful. <laughs> and um, so they weren't totally wrong to be suspicious, even if vaccines are one of the most amazing innovations and have saved, you know, so many lives uh, and, and thinking, I guess I just closed that piece and felt like, wow, if only people had known this history and thought about, you know, this explosion of this trust and then maybe how better to cope with it. You know, what would a real democratic, like there was public health care, right? So the state was providing medicine, but what would a democratic, inclusive, respectful campaign that didn't make people feel like they were discussing vectors of disease, which is kind of how people felt. Um, so I just sort of thought like, well, 
we do need to we do need to know our history. Like it might not have made things work out perfectly, but maybe we'd be in a better situation than we are today, right? With some of these tendrils that you've identified, but now in a different class formation under different circumstances. So yeah, I guess the lesson is read Lapham's quarterly, you know your history, folks. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I would also say that Esther, there's like a very direct connection between Benjamin Lay and the anti-vaccination movement because the abolitionist movement, so those who fought to abolish the slave trade first and then the practices of slavery, that they were in Britain, at least really the first activist movement. So they're the ones who then teach everybody who follows, everybody else who has an issue, right? Um, how to behave, right? Like, what does a protest movement look like? So they are actually the ones, people like Benjamin Lay, who are establishing the ground rules for what does protest look like? And so people who joined the anti-vaccination movement, so um, slavery is abolished in Britain in 1833, and the anti-vaccination movement starts in 1853. So there's just a 20 year gap between that. So some of those people were anti-slavery activists who have now turned their attention to another cause. Um, and they very much understood themselves as slaves. Um, um, Graham sort of thinking about freedom versus determinism, but all the way up through the 19th century, it was um, free slave. That was the, the dyad that people were working with. That was the binary. And so we might see it as, you know, as a reach or inappropriate for anti-vaccinationists to think of themselves as being enslaved by compulsory vaccination. But it was, it made sense to them within their worldview that the slave is a slave because they they are fundamentally unfree. They do not control their own person. And so anti-vaccinators saw themselves as a parallel case. But they were involved in a lot of the same kinds of movements that Benjamin Lay and other anti-slavery activists were involved with. They drew direct connections between themselves and non-human animals. So people who are anti-vaccinationists were also involved in um, the animal rights movement. So they were anti-vivisectionists, which means they were against the scientific experimentation on animals. Um, many of them were vegetarians like Benjamin Lay. They were not eating meat um, because they were, again, thinking about control over the body and thinking about the way we treat other bodies um, that live amongst us. So not only humans, but non-humans. So I found reading about Benjamin Lay very um, inspiring, but also just very comfortable that I thought, oh, these are, this is the same kind of person. And it's him who has tutored the anti-vaccinationists how to protest and how in particular to kind of shame other people. Um, that idea of attention that Graham's talking about, I mean, anti-vaccinationists staged these mass meetings. Um, they, they were participated in this you know, huge 19th century print culture. So very much like um, social media today, they distributed pamphlets, they published newspapers. So they understood that getting people's attention was critical and they understood how to do that as well. Um, it is wonderful seeing all these threads tied together in this thing that you mentioned, Nadia, about the way that the anti-vaccination movement distributed pamphlets. It, it felt so contemporary to the way that we talk about misinformation spreading online, that even if uh, the audience, you know, we think is much bigger and the dissemination is much quicker. It's this, the same, you know, the same goal and the same, the same methods just translated onto a screen instead of a, you know, a screen print. Um, I want to move on to the Q&A section. I'm going to um, open that up. But before we do so, just thank you again so much to the three of you for your insights, for your work, for contributing to LAPAMS um, and for having this conversation, which has been so illuminating. Um, I have a question from Don. Uh, what vessels have we, both intra and interspecially, um, activated metaphysically, materially, and socially that we have to hold the agonisms, antagonism, and bumping up against the other that are reproductive today? Um, to which of these vessels would you each suggest we offer our attention and action? Um, who might like join the debt collective <laughs> <laughs> organizing pitch, even if you don't have debt. I mean, I, I'm always, I mean, I think, I think um, collectivities are just really important, right? And we see the power of them for good and ill. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, 
And I actually really agree with what Graham said. I actually think it does begin with attention, the freedom of directing your attention. Um, there's that great uh, Simone Weil quote, right? That unmixed attention is prayer. That there's, you know, there's something really, you know, I think there is something kind of the, the civic religion of organizing or a kind of you know, spiritual practice in it. <laughs> and I say that as a secular person of, you know, paying attention to injustice, trying to, to um, build power with others. But yeah, I mean, I think joining something and having that fidelity to a group or to a cause, whatever it is, we can't all do everything. There are so many emergencies right now making this unbelievable meta emergency. So find, find other people. <laughs> Yeah, and, and if I may, I, I agree completely with what Astra's saying. It really makes it always makes me feel happy to hear um, Simone uh, Vey um, invoked because she is like the kind of patron saint of um, of as you say the kind of uh, civic religion of uh, collective joint attention. Um, Don, the term vessel can mean some different things there, but, you know, when you gloss it and you say, you know, metaphysically, materially, socially, I feel like I have a sense of what you're getting at. And I would just add to what Astra said that, you know, I think and I would defer to her judgment on this, but my intuition is that one of the most harrowing component effects of the set of phenomena that we end up calling neoliberalism has been a powerful and pervasive severing of each from every. We feel more alone now, I believe, than at any point um, within the historical framework of our having social scientific data on that phenomena. And I think that the basic tools for holding people together have undergone such radical shifts that um, between the precarity that people experience, which forces them more and more to focus on number one and survival, and then the disruption of the traditional in real life mechanisms by which intersubjective solidarity has been achieved, the combination of those already had us on the ropes with respect to our ability to gather and organize and move together, even before the pandemic, which I think has further compromised us. So Astra has been at the forefront of reinventing how we can achieve solidarity under these transformed conditions. But I'm, I'm completely on board with Astra's answer, which is cultivate the capacity to join with others. And I think actually mindfulness, which often comes up when you begin to talk about attention, has quickly been suborned as a discourse that subserves this siloed radical individualism. I think basically mindfulness is, I, I'm in favor of mindfulness. If you have a mindful practice, that's awesome. Don't, don't stop. However, like let's move towards some joint forms of attention, not just the forms of self care that can effectively function like the religion of capitalism, like we take away your health care, but we encourage you to take 15 minutes every day to like try to reduce your anger levels so you can continue to be on time for work. And there is a way in which mindfulness discourse via the app world is kind of turning that crank. So we have to be vigilant about the commodification even of the instruments by which we're going to resist our commodification it is just that simple it's that bad it can be a real trap finding that balance between um the mindfulness that allows us to have the attention to um perceive uh what is in front of us versus following mindfulness that is prescriptive and ascribed by a, a by capitalism itself, right? You're talking about app-based mindfulness. Um, Nadia, did you have something to add to Don's question? Another way of saying this is to say that when we think about rights, right? When we think about freedom, we often think about our rights, but that rights always come with responsibilities or they should come with responsibilities. So thinking about the balance between one's own rights and one's responsibilities. And another way of saying that is always to think about, you know, I as an individual 
um, in relationship to my community or communities. So that when we're thinking about rights, freedoms, liberties, we're always thinking about, well, when I exercise my rights, my freedoms, my liberties, you know, in what way am I actually impinging on the rights of others? So always thinking about one's own freedom in relationship to other people's freedoms as well. That's a really important. Um... It, it makes me think very briefly of, uh, you know, it was mentioned in my bio, they do this organizing around electronic music parties, and it's a conversation that happens a lot around how do I enjoy the free space that we have here on the dance floor in a way that allows for others to enjoy that space, which may be a manner that I do not enjoy. You like stuff that lights up and blinks. I don't, you know, it's these from from the, the small spaces where we go to feel physically free to the large question of freedom, that question of rights versus responsibilities is, is a really um, perennial one. Uh, we have one more question um, from an anonymous attendee. Um, in his book, The Psychology of Totalitarianism, the Belgian psychoanalyst Matthias Desmet explains that the very isolation that Graham just described is not only characteristic of all fascist and communist regimes, but has been a deliberate creation of nefarious forces in our own government. Um, given Lapham Quarterly's interest in freedom, shouldn't this be part of the discussion? Hmm. I'm not a member of Lapham, so I don't really feel qualified to speak on, on this on their behalf, but um, if anyone would like to add, uh, feel free to do so. I'll just say really quickly that, um, you know, Lewis uh, himself, who's been an anti-fascist crusader all the way back, has a afterward to the current um, issue, the freedom issue, which looks exactly at the kind of precarious, imminent fascism of our current political conditions. So I don't mean to suggest to the questioner that that, that piece, which is sort of satirical and uh, high key, suffices to delve the questions that you're kind of putting to us. But I do think it's just give a shout out because that is where the whole issue on freedom kind of culminates is with anxiety about exactly those dynamics. Yeah. Um, I see Soraya, you've rejoined the conversation. Is it about time for us to wrap up? Uh, you're, oh, you're muted. Hi, yes, we are at time. Um, if there's another question that has come in that you would like to take, we can do that. Or we could um, say thank you very much for the conversation today, which was really interesting. And um, apologies for the technical difficulties. And it was great to have everyone here. Thank you so much, Zoe, for hosting, Nadia, Astra, and Graham for joining us.